Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris, and uh, welcome to this last day of the presentations. I hope that you have enjoyed the previous sessions and are ready for this day, um, first presentation for today. So um, yeah, it's a bit long of a title. Um, step zero for a multi-party vulnerability coordination is yet another multi-party vulnerability coordination. But don't be scared by it. I will go into the details of this. But just to start with, um, my name is Omer Bukhari, and I'm currently leading the operations for uh, Ericsson PCERT. Um, before we go deep into the topic itself, I would just like to start with a very small brief background of Ericsson itself. I think many of you know. Um, I would say in, in almost all countries, in one way or the other, the telecom networks are built on the products and services that Ericsson provides. Um, and what I would like you to focus on is the amount of products and services that are there in our portfolio, right? Because it's topical for the discussion then we, that we have going forward. Um, so it's over 500 products that we have in our portfolio, quite, quite a massive one, of course, dependencies and all things like that. Um, but yeah, so small bits about Ericsson PCERT also, we have existed since 2004 and during all that, time, as you can imagine, we have matured many of our processes, many things are we doing better, and some of them we can, of course, still learn and improve. And that is exactly the reason for us being in this community, right? Like every time we are here, we learn, we try to contribute. We have been part of FIRST since 2006. We have had, uh, we have been contributing to different initiatives within PCERT SIG and, and all those um, areas also. Um, yeah, very quickly on the stats then, um, we are analyzing roughly around over 15,000 vulnerabilities per year and out of which almost 3,500 plus are something that we have thought, um, let's say during the past year that are somehow applicable to the products that we are responsible for. Um, but yeah, I will not spend too much time on, on this introduction because I am sure that you are all waiting for what are we going to talk about today. Before I get into it, I would just like to set the scene a little bit here um, before we go into what we are going to talk about. So I think the talk is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be a little bit of a war story, if I may say, um, where I run you through a little bit of a multi-party coordination in, in, in our own sense. Um, you, will, you will see the twist there um, that we have done in the past and with the idea that this will give you some hints or some thoughts to take back to your teams and, and think about different things that need to be uh, put into the processes there. And of course, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from all of you um, on your reflections on this after the session. And then the second part will be a little bit more focused on, um, how should I call it, a thought experiment. Um, but I will keep the suspense for now and uh, go forward first by just uh, shortly introducing like, so when we think about a multi-party vulnerability coordination, if we, if we really stay like high level or a bird's eye view, what, what does, like that constitute. Of course, it always constitutes in one way or the other, a finder who has found something and has disclosed it to one vendor or has gone with a public disclosure, then as the name very well depicts, it includes multiple vendors, right? And this could be in many ways, like upstream vendors, downstream vendors, without going into the very tiny details of the things. Basically what we are talking about here is the dependencies. And I think dependencies in today's software world are almost unavoidable, if I may say so. Um, the modular approach to building products is, is, is accepted and of course uh, very valuable. But when you do that, then of course the 
the complexity of handling the vulnerabilities with these dependencies and multiple parties involved come in there. So that's kind of the second big factor of a multi-party uh, vulnerability coordination. And then the last piece is, of course, like, okay, now you know about it, you have been coordinating with all the uh, parties involved. So in the end, you want some good results out of it. Ideally, the results would be what? They would be in the shape of like a coordinated advisory and fixes going out in, in, a, in a very structured, sometimes under embargo and all those sort of tiny details that come with it. But what we want essentially is that at the end of the day, there is in a very systemic manner, um, a disclosure towards all the parties that should know about it and then with, with clear instructions that they can fix it. Not gonna go into much more details of this, but just want to mention that very good instructions on first website about the multi-party coordination and disclosure. Just go and search for it and I'm sure you you find it and I definitely recommend having a look at it. Right, so, but like, okay, so, then the twist I talked about. Hmm. What what do we have here? Let let's just think for a moment it, it, about it this way. Any major vulnerability coordination that you need to do within your organization before you reach a point where you can go and talk about it with the partners or customers or even other part uh, vendors and and all. Usually there are quite a few steps behind it. Like this is what I call step zero in my presentation, basically. Before you reach that level where you can go and you can talk and uh, say like, guys, we have this issue that you all need to now take care of. Or, hey guys, here is an issue that all of you need to fix. These things need to happen. If we again see on a very high level, what are those things? So you would need to inform multiple, multiple organizations within, within your company of course if you are a company of uh, of a scale as 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 us as ericsson um and that of course includes many many development teams within the organization given the dependencies of different components that you might need to involve then you will need to do in a way a little bit of a disclosure to all these development teams but also to many different stakeholders like the business stakeholders legal and and many other parties we will touch upon it um then of course you need to have some sort of collaboration between these uh, development teams to do a fix and after all of this of course you need like the processes to do a coherent communication at the at the end of the day with it so uh, keeping all of these things in mind um if we think about it a little bit i feel this starts sounding like a lot about like a multi-party vulnerability coordination, doesn't it? And if it is that, why not apply all the principles internally also that we would apply to any other multi-party vulnerability coordination? Yeah, it's a little bit of a light bulb moment, but let's do so that I leave you with this thought for a moment, we come back to it. But before going there, what I would like to do is I would like to talk about a little bit of a case or, or a snapshot or a war story that we have handled um, to, to set the scene and give like some basis of where I am coming from um, before I make my points, right? So the example or the case that we are talking about here, it was a vulnerability that we handled in the past. Um, it was identified internally and it was also in one of our internally developed components which happens to be um, quite a well-used component that is used by other Ericsson products to build on top of it. So here comes the dependency aspect that I've been talking about like straight away into this. Um, additional complexity that we had with this uh, fun uh, coordination was also that the fix also required some additional actions to be taken by the customers. It was not like as straightforward per se. Uh, to just have the security update come in and fix it. There were some additional actions on top of that that were needed to be taken by the uh, customers or users. Then if we talk about impact here, we also had to consider a lot of different things, like right, like if uh, if we are talking about 
several products there. Going one level deeper into the level of complexity, think about there are usually multiple uh, versions that are under support for one product. So that again, exponentially increases the number of products or versions that you need to take care of within this context. Um, then also the impact for each affected product would be slightly different, right? Because the component is being used by the product, but it might be used in a very different way for one product and in a very different way for the other. For some, the priority to fix it might be very high because of the way they're using it, because of many other development related processes that, that might exist at that time. And for some, it might be not as high as the others given different risk profiles and all those sort of things. So this is this is all that exists and these are all the dilemmas that you have to face when you have this sort of case. Hmm, okay, then if we know about the impact, let's say we know about the impact, what is next? Next is very much then you need to have buy-in, like before you can do any sort of uh, communication, especially in this sort of case where there are additional actions needed, not just like even a straightforward fix. You need buy-in from many different business stakeholders, first of all, uh, to say like, yes, we will do the coordinated fixes. We will have the timelines available for you so you can plan for it. There will be a lot of help needed from the market areas, legal and communication to set all of this machinery in place um, so that you can in a very coordinated way go ahead go ahead with the communication when it's the time um, and then yeah just uh, very interestingly i think this is a little bit um, i wouldn't say unique but different when it comes to to ericsson and telecom area that you know these these products are many times part of the critical infrastructures these are telecom grade products so doing a completely public disclosures many times is not the ideal thing for us to go after. So we need to, to let's say, tailor the communication a little bit more towards our customers that we know are affected, which we of course know during, through, through, through all uh, the processes that the market areas have. Um, so yeah, this is the added layer of complexity that we usually face uh, within within our PCERT, in, in Ericsson PCERT, when it comes to the communication of these uh, issues outwards. Right, so this was, uh, this was a, a bird's eye view of how the case looked, but I think still, I would like to dig a little bit more deeper to give you a bit more of my insight or how we see from Ericsson piece uh, how the steps go when you have this sort of a major vulnerability coordination, right? So first step is usually always identification, right? So, um, okay, someone found a vulnerability. It could be internal, it could be external, regardless, however it reaches you. Um, now the next step is, okay, component X has a vulnerability. Who uses component X, right? So you need to have the processes in place in your organization to in an effective manner, try to figure out and with, with, a, with a good um, visibility say that, okay, here is a list of products that are using this component. So indirectly, these ones are also very much affected. Um, for, for us in Ericsson, we have like an, in, in-house build tool we call Ericsson Vulnerability Management Service, which we use, it's based on the CPE and I will not go into the details, but we have like a very clear bill of materials that gives us the possibility to look into this whenever there is a component that's affected, we can tell which other products should be involved. All right, so as soon as you know, here is the list now that we know is for sure affected, what should be done next? Right, so the next steps then are that you need to have some sort of info sessions, how we call them, arranged for all these development teams that are now facing this issue uh, that is coming through, uh, through a dependency that they are inheriting through a component that they're using. Um, then what we can recommend for sure is to have a very clear template also of what sort of information would you like to get from these development teams because for example in this case you might have more than 20 development teams working on this right so you you want it coordinated that's why it's always good to have some sort of template and very clear instructions for the development teams that these are the sort of things we would like to have from you 
um, as a result of your uh, investigation. And those things are, as, as mentioned here, on the levels of severity levels, the possible workarounds, and uh, when, like some sort of fixed timeline, like how long is it going to give the fix, right? Because in, in, in an ideal case, we would like to have a coordinated um, vulnerability disclosure. So we are interested in knowing the timelines for these things. While this is happening, and I can assure you that this usually takes a while before all of these things are ready. So while this block is going on in, in parallel and the development teams are doing their job in, in the best way, from the coordinator's point of view, from, from the PSEARCH's point of view, it's, it's excellent that in parallel you start doing this coordination with all the stakeholders, um, all the business stakeholders, the legal, the communication, all aspects you need to cover here because if it's a major coordination, it's very possible that all of these need, people need to have a say. Your processes will dictate, of course, who needs to be involved. Um, but it's, it's, it's very important that at this stage, you already involve them and you start working on already some sort of a preliminary plan. Of course, it will change a little bit based on the information that you will then get from the um, from the investigation once it's finalized, but it wouldn't change so drastically most in most of the cases. So there is a value in starting to do this already. Um, and then, all right, so we have the stakeholders now are, are like aligned, like, okay, there is this, uh, some major coordination coming as soon as we are ready with the investigations. Investigation has now happened in the development teams. What's next? Right, now we need to talk about the fixed coordination. This is the time when we, kind of know um, that, all right, we have the timelines from all the products and we know we have a little bit of a clear idea that here, here is the timeline when all the products will be fixing it. Will they be fixing at the same time or not? Right, so we can decide like, okay, this seems to be the right time frame when we should go out with a, uh, with a communication Ideally, what you want to do is, of course, you want to communicate to all your customers at the same time in, in a coordinated manner so that it's easier for everyone to digest it. The second thing that I really want to emphasize on is that you really, really need to ensure that during this phase, the information is somehow controlled, right? You don't want to prematurely this um, information to go out. Of course, there are chances of its exploitation are greater if that happens, but also it creates a lot of other issues for you to handle. Um, it cre creates additional complexity because if one customer knows you will have to handle them. So uh, it's, it's very, very good to be very clear about who is involved in these coordinations that the, and the information stays till you are ready to disclose it. But on top of that, um, always the challenge you will have is that this is this uh, this will never work exactly how you wanted it to be. There will always be exceptions. Like for example, one that I already explained for this example is that there were some additional actions that were needed to be taken for this fix on top of the. Um, on, on top of the update itself. So we need to plan who will be doing that. Uh, who will support that? What sort of cost uh, is uh, associated with that? Do we have the right stakeholders uh, onboarded to take it on board? Um, and and yeah, of course, then you also need to think about there will always be these products that will not be fixing it for some reason. They're going out of life very soon. There is some other reason. There is the risk profile is so low. So all these sort of things you need to think about and I think it's very good to have these things already mentioned on, on at least a high level in your processes so that you know that if these sort of situations arise, what are your usual uh, lines of action? But once you have all these things in place, uh, the, you are kind of ready for the final preparations. And at this stage, you need to very much start thinking about along with your communications and legal, looking into your support contracts also that, okay, uh, how how should now we be disclosing it? Who should be talking to who? At what level in the cost on the customer's side? And then you need to have, as I said, like the buy-ins and arrangements already done by all the stakeholders if they need to take additional actions, right? Because that needs to be planned accordingly. 
And finally, after all of this, we reach to the point where you're ready to communicate. Um, and uh, fingers crossed, and you <laughs> would think that this should go without any sort of uh, further ado or um, any more complexities at this point. Um, yeah, and as I said, like the communication and like ideally what we want is usually that it's it's communicated to all the customers at the same time. There are uh, people to take care of the additional actions that might be needed to take to be taken at that point and also making sure that there will always be follow up questions right from the customer. So you need to have that aspect in mind, maybe even have a FAQ um, prepared already to um, to answer those questions and then also having the staff available who can do that. But then um, the final piece of this is also that, as you can imagine, not always all the customers will take in the fix right away, right? And if you think it's a very critical issue that you're disclosing, sometimes you have the in, in, in favor of the bigger interest, it is always good, good to have some sort of follow up with the customers um, after you have done the communication to still put some uh, emphasis that, hey, we think that this is very important and you should go with uh, fixing this issue as soon as possible. Right, so this was a little bit of, a, of an overview of how this coordination, one of the coordination and some insights, I hope I, I was able to deliver some good insights to you. These are the aspects that you need to usually consider in a major vulnerability coordination. So now is the, I would say the thought experiment part, right? Uh, on the right side, you see the, the first vulnerability coordination, coordinated disclosure as, as it is in the document as use case two. And here, like the, some roles are defined. And if you just somehow try to link it to this uh, case that I just explained, you see that it was found by the internal security team. So that can take the role of the finder. It affected a modular component. So that's basically the upstream vendor and all the other affected products are then the downstream vendors naturally. The customers who are uh, like the market support can, can act as the defenders. This is not like, like 100% of, of a linking, but they can of course help if there is a workaround. And then the customers are all, with, all of course, the users and PCRT acts as the coordinator here. So like my point of saying this is that with very small changes done to this, and before I make my point, maybe I even go to the next slide. Here, what I'm trying to do is that there are eight variants if you will, and I will hope that you will go and look at the first, uh, uh, you will have a look at the first uh, vulnerability coordination uh, document that I just linked in the in the beginning. There are seven variants for this use case for coordinated disclosure that are there. Um, I will just read out a couple of those. So if you think that security testing team makes the vulnerability details public prior to the remediation. Um, we considered that as, as you saw in the explanation that I gave. Customers do not deploy remediation immediately. We, we had to consider that also. Let's say, for example, a dependent product makes the vulnerability details public prior to the remediation. A very big uh, consideration that we also had in the process there. The next one, for example, a dependent product does not remediate a reported vulnerability. This is also, as, as, as I explained in the uh, exception handling step, it was also there. So like what, what my thought around this is um, and what I would kind of like to leave you with is if you think about it, all like this modular approach of building products, using one component once it's built and using it for the other, other products, it's quite accepted. And um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it works very well. So it's not going away. And if we accept that, the vulnerability dependencies, both internal and external, they won't be going away either, right? Which means that the need for multi-party vulnerability coordination will only grow more and more. And what I want to leave you with is the thought that in my opinion, all the major vulnerability coordinations happening internally in your organizations are also essentially 
just multi-party vulnerability coordinations because the objectives, the roles, and the required steps are fairly similar very, with very small changes. You can basically use very good framework that is already available to you. And why, why would I say that? Or why, what is kind of the benefit? Why I'm saying this is because once you have this multi-party vulnerability coordination guidelines implemented in your organization, and it's just one, it, it, it helps you in the way that it helps train your internal staff for any external coordinations that might come. And then like the biggest benefit is that you have just one process that they need to follow. If there is at some point an external uh, party that they need to coordinate with, it's just another stakeholder that's added to the process, but the process essentially remains the same. So this is kind of the thought I am going to leave you with, and I would be very happy to listen your thoughts about it. In my opinion, all vulnerability internal coordinations are multi-party coordinations, and uh, the step zero for even reaching that multi-party external vulnerability coordination is yet an internal one. So thanks a lot uh, for listening and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Anna. that was really interesting. I think it, it sort of, it demonstrates the complexities of, of the operational day-to-day -day issues that you face with multi-party. I've worked in big organizations. I, you know, one likes to think that they're all very seamless and they all work together and they all follow the same goal. They're, they're essentially in many ways separate businesses with separate plans and priorities and it can be a real real challenge that was really interesting i i, I very much appreciate that thank you